Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Out of the 50 United States, tonight coronavirus infections are dropping in just four of them. Think about that for a minute. Four months into the outbreak in this country, more than 126,000 lives lost, and there are only four states in the entire nation, the ones in green, where the infection rate is actually going down. In 31, the ones in orange and red, cases are rising and have now for, uh, been rising for several weeks. 15 other states, the numbers are holding steady. The surge is happening in small states and large, red states and blue, though mostly now in the South and the West. It's not, as the president likes to say, because we're just so gosh darn good at testing. We aren't so good at testing. In fact, in many places, testing continues to be hard to get. These long lines of cars are outside a clinic in Austin, where some people are here for their second or third time, having been turned away before. And this is in the capital of Texas, one of the large, largest, wealthiest, most populated states in the country, where not only is the case count rising, so is the number of people being hospitalized every day. In a moment, we'll talk with a doctor in Houston where hospitals are operating at or near capacity. Again, this is not for more testing. A greater percentage of tests are coming back positive, meaning there are more infected people out in the community. In Texas, it's about 15 percent, triple what it was in May. In Los Angeles, the positivity rate has doubled in the last month, and this new surge has prompted state and local officials to take action. Cities in Florida are closing beaches for the Independence Day weekend and requiring people to wear masks. The governor of Kansas just enacted a statewide mask order, and late today, the governor of Arizona reimposed restrictions, closing bars and nightclubs and gyms and movie theaters and water parks. Even New Jersey, which, like New York, has seen its hospitalization rate plummet and positivity numbers drop into the low single digits, even that state is slowing down plans to reopen, and New York is considering doing the same. But all of this is proceeding state by state, sometimes locality by locality or even one public official at a time. For instance, here's Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell today. We must have no stigma, none, about wearing masks when we leave our homes and come near other people. Wearing simple face coverings is not about protecting ourselves. It is about protecting everyone we encounter. So there's that, and it does mark a change. And the vice president this weekend, who rarely even lets the word mask fall from his lips, uh, preferring to say face covering, actually did it. He said the M word. If your local officials in consultation with the state uh, are directing you to wear a mask, we encourage uh, everyone to wear a mask uh, in the affected areas. And where you can't maintain social distancing, uh, wearing a mask is just a good idea. Uh, and it will, we know from experience, uh, will slow the spread. We know from experience. This is being touted by some as a sign of progress, what he just said. And just think about it, how incredible that is. The man who allegedly heads the coronavirus task force, grudgingly and haltingly encouraging people now to wear masks, if their local officials say they should, that seems like progress? After all these number of people who've died, after all we've known and how long this thing has been going on, that's progress. After rarely wearing a mask in public for weeks and backing the president who doesn't wear a mask and lives like the vice president does in a biological bunker with everyone around them subject to repeated testing and temperature taking and mask wearing, now he's pretending to be responsible and suggest wearing a mask. Why don't you put on your own mask, Mr. Vice President, and keep it on? You know, the only reason he doesn't is because he's scared about the president. I mean, Certainly not a profile in courage with this one. This is the guy running the coronavirus task force, allegedly, allegedly running what he is fond of calling the whole of government effort against the disease. What whole of federal government effort? Oh, yeah, he did wear a mask at Sunday services at a mega church in Dallas, which might count for something if it hadn't, you know, been at a mega church in Dallas with a hundred person choir, many of whom appear in the upper age ranges not wearing masks singing their lungs out, spraying aerosol into the enclosed indoor space and onto the people singing all around them. So yeah, this is where we are. Going to a manifestly unsafe event, but wearing a mask some of the time is now what counts as progress for the guy allegedly leading the federal effort against the virus. Perhaps by those same low standards, his words this weekend were an improvement over his flat-out dishonesty at Friday's first in two months task force briefing. We slowed the spread. We flattened the curve. We saved lives. Clearly, someone wrote that statement. Yes, it's written to make headlines. And yet, yeah, some states did do that, but not enough. And notice he's speaking in the past tense. This is the same virus we had months ago. 
It didn't vanish like the president predicted. It didn't diminish into local brush fires like the president promised. It's the same deadly virus. The federal government and a whole lot of governors just decided to stop giving a damn about it. Also, the vice president today defended the president holding big rallies in Tulsa and Phoenix as a First Amendment issue. Then when asked a second time, he rambled on for more than three minutes without answering the question before abruptly ending the briefing. We do not know when or even if there will be another briefing. None is scheduled for this virus task force. What we do know is, as far as the president is concerned, the picture that is plain to see, especially compared to other parts of the world, simply does not exist. Before, before I play you what his press secretary said today, I just want you to look at this graph, because it's really telling. European countries are the pink line there. We're the green. We don't want to be that green line. They trended up, the European countries, about a month before we did. Remember all those stories about Italy, how terrible things were in Italy? Well, we are now Italy. They came back down because of strong, coordinated national measures. They were forced to stay at home. It was hard. It was devastating economically, but it worked, just like it worked in other places, but not here, because we didn't have strong, coordinated national measures, and we didn't stick with it. South Korea never even had a big bump, same virus. They had their act together on a national level on testing and tracing. They took it seriously. That was back when cases were low enough to get a handle on. The U.S. is the green line, which plateaued and is now rising sharply. That is what failure looks like, and that's where we are. Here's how the spokesperson who speaks for the president characterized the outbreak in mask wearing. We're aware that there are embers um, that need to be put out, um, but these signs of uh, a decreasing fatality, um, increased and enhanced therapeutics that we've identified, four of them, dexamethasone, convalescent plasma, um, and remdesivir, and one other that they are working, remdesivir in particular, reduces hospital time by a third. Um, so these things make us uniquely equipped uh, to handle the increase in cases that we've seen. The CDC guidelines are they are recommended but not required. Um, and we, the president, would encourage everyone to follow the orders of their local jurisdiction and CDC guidelines. Embers, she calls them. I'll say it again. 31 states are seeing rising cases. Th those aren't embers. If that's an ember, I don't want to see what Ms. McEnany calls an actual inferno, because that's, according to health officials, is what this is. As we note now, nearly every night, the president is done with it. Never mind what his own experts say. Never mind what state and local officials are now saying and doing. How many times do you actually hear the president, what Ms. McEnany said, urging people to, you know, wear masks if their local officials say so? Never mind that just yesterday, Alex Azar, his own health, Secretary of Health and Human Services, said, quote, the window is closing, unquote, when it comes to stopping this surge. He might have said the same four months ago when the window really was closing, but the president then as now was too busy saying other things. When you have 15 people and the 15 within a couple of days is going to be down to close to zero, uh, that's a pretty good job we've done. Now, Azar says the window is closing. He said nothing then. Perspective now from CNN Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. Sanjay Gupta, also Dr. Peter Hotez, Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. Sanjay, um, the, dep the principal deputy director of the CDC said today that she thinks that people engaged in wishful thinking, that they thought summer would come and everything would be fine, which is obviously what the president said would happen. Um, it it's just stunning to me when you see that graph of where the European Union, countries of the European Union are and where we are, and we were on the same trajectory, we were on the same path, and they got it right and we didn't. I mean, it's, and it's just a matter of leadership. No doubt. Uh, I mean, because you do see that uh, we are all humans. Uh, this virus is the same in terms of how it behaves in humans around the world. And uh, those, those lines do tell a story. Uh, tomorrow, Anderson, will be six months since the World Health Organization first heard about this mysterious pneumonia cluster out of China. Six months. And during that time, we have had 10 million people around the world who have become infected, 500,000 people who have died. And as you know, I mean, a quarter of that, those numbers are, are here in the United States. The concern, obviously, Anderson, is as bad as those numbers are. When you start to see what's happening in some of these states around the country, and I've talked to some of the officials on the ground today in these various places, there, there's a real concern that the numbers will increase. I think that that's, that's significant because this is like a, it starts to gain momentum and then, and, and then it's no longer growing linearly. It starts to grow into exponential growth. But the bigger concern, and you mentioned Italy, is, is why was the fatality rate so high in Italy uh, near the beginning of their, their epidemic? 
In part, it was because of the incredible strain on the hospital system, right? There were people who couldn't get in to get care. There were people who died preventable deaths, or as you know, the Doctors Without Borders call it stupid deaths, deaths that are absolutely unnecessary and preventable. That's a real concern, and you know, Peter's here, uh, he's in Houston. Houston is, is obviously uh, on the cusp of something like that where people may not be able to get care. I mean, they're, they're, they could be saying, my loved one is having shortness of breath. They need to go to the hospital, and they may be told, hey, look, keep them at home as long as possible. We're not sure we got room right now. That is not the position we want to be in.